In today's video, I'm going to be telling you the entire history of behavioral economics. We're going to go through decade by decade, and I'm going to try and convey what I think were the most important developments in the field during those years. Now, please bear in mind, I'm trying to cover over 70 years of history here in a 20 minute video. So I've had to be selective with who and what I talk about in each decade. So if your favorite researcher didn't make it into the video, I'm sorry, I'm obviously biased towards the people who I know the most and um, whose work I'm most familiar with, so please bear that in mind when you're watching the video. But hopefully, by watching this video, you'll have a really uh, good overview of how the field has developed over the years. So without further ado, we start our journey in early economics. As a species, we have been trying to understand economics for millennia. You can track understanding of economics in ancient Egypt, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, ancient China, and the Islamic world. Basically, ever since we've had society, we've been trying to understand economics. But it wasn't until the 19th century that real pioneers in the field developed what our modern understanding of economics would be built off of. Those people were people like David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, and most notably, Adam Smith. Adam Smith is often regarded as the father of modern economic thought. He wrote The Wealth of Nations, and in many ways, Adam Smith was the first behavioral economist. If you read his book, A Theory of Moral Sentiments, he describes a way of decision-making that is remarkably similar to the dual process theories that people use in behavioral economics today. He describes how people often make decisions with their passions, and that often we have to have a second decision-making system that helps to reel in the passions and override us and take an outside view in order for us to come to a rational conclusion, which is remarkably similar to things like System 1 and System 2 that are famous in the world of behavioral economics today. So, in many ways, Adam Smith was the first behavioral economist. But between the time of Adam Smith and, well, the 1950s, economics seems to have gotten lost. We lost these ideas of passions or emotional decision-making, and instead economic models became increasingly reductionist and assumed perfect rationality from the people involved in the models. And that brings us on to the first modern behavioral economist in the 1950s. In the 1950s, a guy called Herbert Simon introduced the concept of bounded rationality. And this was an absolutely groundbreaking idea in the world of economics. What Herbert Simon argued was that people's ability to make rational choices wasn't infinite. We simply don't have the cognitive power, the brain power, to consider all the pros and cons of every decision that we make. And so we often will make a lot of decisions that aren't rational because well, our rationality is bounded by these biological constraints. He also pointed out that often we make decisions with less attention than we might need to make a rational decision. Our attention is limited, or often many of our decisions are made with imperfect information. And that also leads to irrational decision-making. Now, those ideas are still concepts that we talk about in behavioral economics today, and it was Herbert Simon in the 1950s to really bring those to the fore of economic conversation. Now, in this video, I'm going to be talking a lot about Daniel Kahneman and Richard Thaler, who are often credited with founding the field of behavioral economics, and maybe rightly so, but I wanna give a special shout out to Herbert Simon, who really was the first modern behavioral economist. So in the 1960s, Kahneman was a professor of psychology at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And one day, as is common practice, he invites one of his students to give the lecture. That student was Amos Tversky. And what Tversky argued in his lecture was that people are rational, but they make irrational decisions when they have imperfect information, when they don't have the right knowledge to come to the right conclusion. And when Kahneman heard this, he vehemently disagreed. In fact, he argued with Tversky in the middle of the class because Kahneman said that he had observed people with good information still making the wrong decision. Now, the reason why Kahneman believed this so strongly is because this is something that he had observed himself in the Israeli military. He noticed that recruiters were often falling victim to something called the halo effect, which is when we overweight the first impression that we get of somebody and ignore red flags that we see later. Kahneman noticed that recruiters were seeing these recruits, getting a good first impression, but then when they continue to perform poorly in the test, in the recruiting process, they would still let them pass at the end because of this halo effect. And so that was a very clear example to Kahneman how somebody can have all the correct information, 
and yet still come to the wrong conclusion. But this wasn't enough to satisfy the debate between Kahneman and Tversky, so the two of them decided to collaborate and run an experiment to get to the bottom of this argument. The experiment involved asking statistical questions to students who had weak statistical backgrounds and trained statisticians. What they found in their study was that when the students with weak statistical skills were asked about the questions, well, they got them wrong, as you would predict. But what's interesting is that when it came to the trained statisticians, they also came to the wrong conclusion, which kind of proves Kahneman right, that people who have the right knowledge, the right background, can still come to the wrong conclusion. But what was interesting about this study was that it actually posed a bigger problem. Kahneman and Tversky realized that there may be a systematic problem with how people interpret statistics. And that's because the experiment that they did showed statisticians results with a very small sample size. And many statisticians failed to account for the small sample size, meaning that the study, the result had less power. And so this was one of the early conclusions that Kahneman and Tversky came to with each other, realizing that people don't appreciate the importance of sample size. So that brings us to the 1970s, where Kahneman and Tversky continued to work with each other, but now from the United States. Kahneman was at the University of Chicago, and Tversky was at Stanford. And during this decade, they collaborated a lot and published a lot of papers together, and most importantly, in 1979, they released a very famous paper called Prospect Theory. And Prospect Theory would go on to be one of the most important papers in all of behavioral economics, laying the groundwork for concepts like loss aversion, reference dependent pricing, so on and so forth. And it was also during this time at the University of Chicago that Kahneman met another young economist by the name of Richard Thaler. So that's all I'm going to say on the 1970s for now. We're going to talk more about Kahneman and Thaler in a second. So in the 1980s, Richard Thaler began to become a pioneer in behavioral economics on his own. He focused a lot on the financial side of behavioral economics and solidified the concept of mental accounting, which is a super important concept that I still use today in my work as a behavioral scientist. And the idea of mental accounting is that people allocate money to different pots in their head which can lead to very irrational behavior. For example, people will often have a savings pot and a spending pot. Let's say the savings pot is for a new car. Now what might happen is that their spending pot depletes to zero and then they have to make a choice. Do they want to take out a loan or do they just want to take money from their saving pot for their car in order to pay their bills? And what we'd often find is that people would go and take out a loan despite having all of these savings reserved but they wouldn't want to spend those savings because those savings were for car money. So in the 1990s, off the back of Kahneman, Tversky and Thaler's pioneering research in the field, we saw an explosion of new research in the academic community researching behavioral economics. There was a guy called Dan Ariely who got a PhD then met Daniel Kahneman who told him to go get a second PhD and then he did. Because, you know, having one PhD isn't enough. You gotta have two, guys, otherwise you're, what, are, what are you even doing here? Dan Ariely would go on to be one of the most famous people in behavioral economics, a pioneer in his own right, and one of the best-selling authors in the field. And also during the 1990s, what's really exciting was that many of the people who lectured me at Warwick were not only doing research in the field of behavioral economics, but really leading the conversation in the academic community. People like Nick Chater, George Lowenstein, and I want to give a special shout out to my man, Graham Looms. Big up Graham Looms because in the 1990s he published a paper called Regret Theory along with his collaborator Robert Sugden. Okay, editing Pete here. I realized in editing this video that I actually made a mistake. Graham Looms published Regret Theory in the 1980s, but this next bit that I'm gonna say where I say that this sparked a lot of conversation in the field, a lot of that academic conversation was happening in the 90s. So little caveat there, published in the 80s, conversation was really brewing hard in the 90s. Back to the video. And Regret Theory was really a landmark paper in the field of behavioral economics. It described how people will often make irrational decisions in order to try and avoid regret, which lay the foundation for concepts that I use in my job on a day-to-day -day basis, things like regret aversion. 
And this really marked the start of a new cluster of research in behavioral economics, which looked into how our emotions can affect our decision making and lead to contradictions according to economic models. Another cluster of research that we saw developing in the 1990s was how behavioral economics related to the law. Isn't that against the law? I am the law! People were looking at concepts like the endowment effect that says that people value things they own more than things that they don't own. And we're wondering how that might affect things like property rights and whether property rights would be allocated fairly and optimally when this endowment effect was in place. And what they found, surprise, surprise, was that endowment effect meant that often these markets weren't distributed optimally because people were really unwilling to give up what they owned, even if they had better payoffs that were possible. Now you're probably wondering what Kahneman is researching at this time, and Kahneman at this time seemed to be very preoccupied with the idea of fairness in markets. And what Kahneman realized was that a lot of people were very concerned with fairness. And you know, fairness really isn't something that traditional classical economic models would take account of, that people would care about fair distribution and sort of pro-social behavior. But Kahneman did a lot of research to prove that this wasn't the case. And once again, markets wouldn't come to the optimal economic equilibrium because people were concerned with issues of fairness. <laughs> And that brings us to the 2000s. And I hope you can see how each decade we go to, behavioral economics is growing and expanding. And 2000 definitely saw a massive explosion of interest in behavioral economics. The decade kicked off with Daniel Kahneman winning the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2002, primarily for his work in prospect theory that I mentioned earlier. Prospect theory was totally groundbreaking in the world of economics, and that's why he won the Nobel Prize. Now the really cool thing about Daniel Kahneman winning the Nobel Prize and one of the reasons why I admire him so much is because it's just so cool to see a psychologist win a Nobel Prize. There is no Nobel Prize for psychology so we kind of have to steal the economics Nobel Prize and Kahneman was the first and only person to do that so far. So of course, off the back of this Nobel Prize, there's a huge surge in interest in behavioral economics. Not only from the academic community, but there starts to be a hunger from the general public to learn more about this fascinating research into decision making. But unfortunately, at this point in time, in the early 2000s, a lot of this academic research is, well, hidden in academic journals. It's not very accessible for the everyday person. But in 2008, all of that changed, because Richard Thaler, who we talked about earlier, worked with a guy called Cass Sunstein, who's actually a lawyer, and the two of them publish a book called Nudge. And Nudge is an absolutely groundbreaking book in the field. It sells millions of copies, is massively popular, and is the first time that behavioral economics was communicated to millions of people in an accessible, easy to read way. In the book Nudge, Thaler was telling people about all of those early concepts that he and Kahneman and Tversky discovered in those early years of behavioral economics. And the important thing about Nudge was that it connected the dots between this academic research in behavioral economics and how it can be used in public policy by governments and by businesses too. So at the release of this book, millions of people, non-academics who had never been exposed to the concepts of behavioral economics before, were suddenly learning about it for the first time. And one of those people was a guy called Rory Sutherland. Now I know this story because Rory was my former boss and so we used to talk about things. And what Rory told me was that in 2008, he got sick. And as you do when you get sick, you cancel all your plans and as you recover, you suddenly find yourself with a lot of time to just think about stuff. And during this time, Rory was exploring and he found out that this book called Nudge was being released very soon. Now Rory lives in the UK and Nudge was being released in America. So he special ordered a copy of Nudge to the UK. And according to him, he had one of only two copies in the UK. And I might be getting the details of this uh, slightly wrong, but it's something like he had one copy and the only other copy in the country was owned by the Prime Minister, apparently. <laughs> and when Rory read this book, something went off in his head. He realized the value of this to businesses. Because you see, Rory wasn't an academic like Thaler and Kahneman. No, Rory was an advertising person, an ad man. And after his many decades of working in the industry, he had noticed many weird quirks of how to persuade people with his advertising that couldn't be rationally explained by economic models. And what he found in Nudge and behavioral economics was a systematic, systemic way of proving the things that he had observed 
with academic rigor and the scientific method. What behavioral economics shows time after time after time is in human behavior and behavioral change, there's a very, very strong disproportionality at work. But Rory wasn't the only one to realize the value of this to his organization. In fact, the government of the UK set up the Behavioural Insights Team, or as it's better known, the Nudge Unit, and this was co-set up by Richard Thaler. And this was kind of the first government organisation to sort of formally use behavioural economics in public policy. So it was a hugely influential in organisation, and just the existence of it gave behavioural economics a lot of legitimacy in the political sphere. During this decade, we also see behavioral economics start to incorporate into the policy of the US government. In 2006, they released something called the Pension Protection Act, which was based on behavioral economic research. And what this proved was that people basically are very bad at saving for their retirement, for their pension, and so the Pension Protection Act helped them do that. So the 2000s were massively important for behavioral economics. It's the decade where it went from being something that was popular only in academic circles to now being popular in political and business circles as well. But let's move on to the 2010s because it only gets crazier from here. When we get to the 2010s, behavioral economics had cemented itself as a truly respectable field of study. And in 2011, millions more people would be introduced to behavioral economics because Daniel Kahneman released his best-selling book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Now this book, when it came out in 2011, was absolutely revolutionary. It blew a lot of people's mind, the research that he talked about from his own work, from the work of people like Richard Thaler, and of course a lot of early psychology work that hadn't really received a lot of public attention before, was now receiving a lot of public attention thanks to the popularity of his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. That's the book where he introduced the concepts of System 1 and System 2, which are now pervasive and prevalent and used all throughout the behavioral economics industry. Now, as long-term viewers of this channel will know, you'll know that I don't really think that Thinking Fast and Slow still holds up over a decade later. The research that he talks about in the book just simply hasn't stood the test of time in terms of its reliability as a source of information. However, at the time of release, it certainly seemed at least fairly robust according to the current understanding, and got a lot more people interested in the field. And by the time we got to 2017, research and interest in the field was at an all-time high, and to top it all off, a second Nobel Prize was given to a behavioral economist because in 2017, Richard Thaler also won the Nobel Prize in economics. But just as importantly as winning the Nobel Prize, during this decade, people like Dan Ariely and Rory Sutherland were becoming well-known in their own right, giving talks like on TED, for example. And during this decade, both Dan Ariely and Rory gave three talks on TED, each with millions of views. So it was during the 2010s that behavioral economics seemed to really get properly popular. Between thinking fast and slow, the continued success of Nudge, Thaler winning the Nobel Prize, and these talks getting millions of views each, a lot of people were getting interested in behavioral economics, and one of the people who watched one of those talks was me. I remember watching Dan Ariely's talk first and then going on to watch Rory's talks. And I was completely inspired by these two individuals, became immediately obsessed with the field of behavioral economics. That summer, I'd go on to read Thinking Fast and Slow, Nudge, Predictably Irrational, these classic books in the field of behavioral economics, and decided there and then that I was going to dedicate my entire career and basically my whole life towards furthering this field of behavioral economics and now behavioral science. So while doing these kinds of talks isn't, you know, as groundbreaking in terms of furthering the academic literature, they are in my opinion, just as important because not only do they inspire the next generation of behavioral economists, people like myself, people like you watching this video, but they also inspire people to apply behavioral economics into the real world. You further this academic research, take it out of the ivory tower behind these paywall journals and get it into the real world where this amazing research can actually benefit people's lives. So thank you to Ariely and Rory and all the other amazing communicators of behavioral science, Thaler and Kahneman included in that list as well, of course, because without them, this research would never actually help anybody. 
that brings us on to the 2020s, or just modern times. Currently, the state of behavioral economics is extremely positive. We have consultancy set up by people like Rory doing extremely well. We see behavioral science teams being developed in major banks, in major companies, and all kinds of organizations and governments across the world. The field of classical economics continues to be influenced by behavioral economics to a greater and greater degree, with many economists incorporating behavioral ideas into their more modern models. But today, really, in 2020, the main word that we use for describing this field isn't behavioral economics, it's behavioral science, right? Behavioral economics is kind of reserved for those academics who do research into sort of proving how people aren't rational, but most people who work in this field, in this industry, use the term behavioral science because we've kind of gone beyond just kind of proving what economics is wrong. We understand that at this point. Now it's really looking at mainly psychology actually to discover how people really make decisions. And we look at psychology, we look at economics, but we also look at things like sociology, anthropology, evolutionary biology, to try and figure out the bottom of the question, you know, why do people do what they do? So these days, people like myself say, I work in behavioral science, not behavioral economics, because it's a more encompassing term. And of course, one big thing that happened in 2020 was me starting this YouTube channel. <laughs> now, I'm not going to pretend that me starting this YouTube channel is on the same level as Kahneman publishing Prospect Theory or Thaler winning the Nobel Prize, but what I understood by starting this YouTube channel was that a lot of this research from behavioral economics isn't very accessible to the everyday person. Firstly, if you're not from a Western country where you can study this formally at university, it's pretty difficult to get access to this information. But two, just reading that much information is just very dense. It's not very accessible for a lot of people. And if we're going to inspire the next generation of behavioral economists, I wanted to bring this kind of research into a more modern format. And for me, my chosen format is YouTube. And before I sign off, I just wanna acknowledge the fact that every name that I've mentioned in this video has been a Jewish or Western male. So let me finish on a note that tells you some of the more amazing women who work in this field and tell you about some of the amazing research that's happening in countries that aren't just the UK or the US. So on the international side of things, there are amazing behavioral science consultancies that I've met people from who are doing incredible applied work, applying behavioral science to non-Western countries. Companies like the Busara Center based in Kenya and Magenta do amazing work all across Africa, the Middle East, and many other non-Western countries. And if you are a young woman watching this video and you're discouraged by the fact that everybody that I've mentioned so far has been a man, please don't be. Today, in the 2020s, some of my favorite researchers are women. Incredible people who are not just researchers in the field, but are actually pioneering researchers, leading a lot of the most groundbreaking work and discovering the concepts that I use in my job in this field of behavioral science every single day. Just to name a few, you have Angela Duckworth, the author of Grit, Katie Milkman, the author of How to Change, Professor Wendy Wood, one of my personal mentors and someone who's widely regarded as the world's leading expert on the science of habits, hugely influential person, and I think everybody should go and read her book, Good Habits, Bad Habits. I could list so many more too, Laurie Santos, Lisa Feldman Barrett, Gana Pogrebna, so on and so forth. There are so many amazing people working in the field of behavioral science, behavioral economics, who are women. And so please don't feel discouraged if you are a young girl watching this video. Okay, so on that note, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.